Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this webinar on census mailing operations and self-response. As you know, Asian Americans Advancing Justice is working to ensure a full and accurate count of our communities in the 2020 census. As the National Hub, we're working to develop curriculum and materials to support your Get Out the Count work, including fact sheets, toolkits, webinars, social media graphics, translated materials, and more. Today, we're excited to dive deeper into 2020 census mailing operations, how to self-respond, language support, and more. As you may know, this webinar is the 16th installment of our monthly census webinar series, which we launched in August 2018. If you missed our previous webinars and want to tune in, you can access them with the link on this slide or go to our website at countusin2020.org. We are joined today by two great colleagues in our Get Out the Count work. Beth Link is director of the Census Counts Campaign at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Leadership Conference Education Fund. In this role, she is responsible for leading the campaign to ensure that the upcoming 2020 census is fair and accurate. Before joining the Leadership Conference and the Education Fund, Beth was the Associate Director of Federal Communications for Planned Parenthood Federation of America and Planned Parenthood Action Fund, where she was instrumental in driving communication strategy and public narratives for major interdepartmental policy and electoral campaigns, including the successful campaign to defeat the repeal of the Affordable Care Act in 2017 and the I Stand with Planned Parenthood campaign. Prior to joining Planned Parenthood, Beth worked at the Raven Group, a national public policy firm directing aggressive and disciplined strategies for leading national nonprofit organizations, foundations, and companies. She's also worked on Capitol Hill in the office of Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky and worked on the 2012 Obama for America campaign. We're also joined by Suhair Adi, who is the policy and campaign specialist at the Arab American Institute. Suhair graduated from University of California, Berkeley in 2018 with bachelor's of arts degrees in Middle Eastern studies and political science. While at UC Berkeley, she conducted her own research on the interplay between gender informed group identity, labor formations, political preferences, and the role of women in Palestinian society. She has served as a research assistant for a report titled No Safe Space, Health Consequences of Tear Gas Exposure Among Palestine Refugees, published by the U.S the UC Berkeley Human Rights Center. Prior to joining AAI, Suhair worked at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at UC Berkeley. Merging her passion for policy work and her love for her community, Suhair is thrilled to be working on education policy and the 2020 census at AAI. Beth and Suhair, thank you so much for joining us today. We will have Q&A at the end of the webinar, and for those of you who are on the GoToWebinar app, you can use the chat box or the questions box to send your question, or you can raise your hand to have your line unmuted so you can ask the question yourself. If you have questions during the presentations, please also use the chat box or the questions box to send us your questions. Lastly, this webinar is recorded, and we will send out the recording as well as this presentation after the webinar. Be sure to check out our census website at countusin2020.org for all of our webinars and accompanying summary blogs. The website also hosts our toolkit, fact sheets, partner resources, and more. And just as an update on our Countusin 2020 resources this month, we updated our community engagement and communications toolkit and all 12 Get Out the Count fact sheets in English with new information from the Census Bureau and our campaign. So you can find those resources at countusin2020.org slash resources. And new customizable templates are available for all 12 Get Out the Count fact sheets in English. Um, for all of these fact sheets, there's a place where you can add your logo and personalize and add local contact information. And lastly, for those 12 Get Out the Count fact sheets, we are also in the process of, process of updating all of the translations in the 15 Asian languages, and those will be uploaded in the next few days. And lastly, our census hotline is live. Call our census hotline at 844-2020-API for support in English and other languages. Again, the number is 844-2020-API or 844-2020-274. And you can visit our website for more information. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Beth, with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you so much for having me, um, and uh, really excited to join everybody for this webinar today. Uh, my name is Beth Link. I am the Census Counts Campaign Director at the Leadership Conference Education Fund, uh, and I have the absolute pleasure 
uh, of working with Bessie and Raima um, and everyone um, at Asian Americans Today for Justice um, at, at the Leadership Conference um, on Civil and Human Rights. We are so grateful to have Asian Americans Advancing Justice as a co-chair of our Census Task Force um, and be really working hand in hand with us in this work for decades. So really um, excited to be here uh, with all of you. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, just very briefly, the Leadership Conference uh, is uh, convening uh, and working with a number of partners to support the Census Counts Coalition. Um, so our Census Counts campaign, which I run, is a collaborative effort um, involving national organizations, um, state-based organizations, and community partners in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, many of you may be working with uh, members of the State Count Action Network across the country uh, or working in local coalition uh, with, with groups uh, that are uh, facilitating um, getting out the count. I think the real distinctive point is that we are working with um, community members uh, and organizations that represent and work deeply with the communities that are most uh, hard to reach uh, and at risk of being missed in the 2020 census. Uh, and we're really looking to deploy that network of trusted messengers that have been there before the census, will be there after the census to get out the count in, 20, uh, in 2020. If we go to the next slide, this is just a sampling of the, the groups that are engaged uh, in our uh, in the national effort. Uh, oh, if you can just go to the next slide. Um, this is just a sampling of the groups that are involved in the overall National Census Counts Coalition. I like to flag this slide just because um, there are lots of resources um, available here. Uh, I think the great uh, first stop is going to uh, the AJC Census Hub for resources, um, but if you're looking uh, for kind of um, other things, a lot of that um, also um, gets elevated, uh, and we're all in this together, so if you have a question, uh, usually uh, someone knows the answer, we're able to kind of uh, tap uh, on this, this really all hands on deck effort. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, I'm here to kind of talk about what are we doing uh, kind of right now uh, to kind of get ready for um, invitations to go out to communities next week, uh, and uh, what are some ways that um, folks can plug in by setting up questionnaire assistance uh, and, and doing canvassing <laughs> and other kinds of outreach. Um, this is just a reminder about key census dates. Um, if you click on the next slide, we're going to really focus in on the self-response period. So I'm going to talk about what's happening uh, over the next two months, uh, really kind of next six to eight weeks uh, uh, in this period. Um, key moment is that March 12th is when the Internet Self-Response uh, portal goes live at 2020census.gov, uh, and that's also when mailers will start to go to people's households. So I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I just from a big picture perspective, I wanted to highlight some of the ways that stakeholders are engaging during this self-response period. Um, from a census counts campaign perspective, we see this as the key moment um, and opportunity for groups to participate um, in the census on their own terms. This is when you can self-respond to the census uh, online, by phone, by uh, returning that census questionnaire by mail, uh, and this is your opportunity to make sure that the information reflects um, how you see and view your household, uh, and uh, the best thing you can do to prevent uh, a, a numerator from coming to your door if that's something that communities are concerned about. During this period, we're going to be really mobilizing a fill out your census form message. The Census Bureau is going to mail out census forms. I'll talk much more about that. Uh, groups are going to be engaging in get off account events and activities. Um, may look like questionnaire assistance, which we'll get to talk about in a second. Uh, there may be canvassing happening. There's going to be live response rate tracking, uh, and then that questionnaire assistance or census kiosks may be happening at the same time. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide, um, and you can actually hit uh, one more as well. Um, there's many ways that the Bureau is uh, collecting information um, and, and their key four key operations. I'm going to hone in on the self-response operation. So just want to flag that there are other ways um, that information is being collected, but we're really going to talk about self-response and particularly the mail out. So go to the next slide. So this is uh, one more slide. Um, so this is a good uh, slide to just maybe like take a screenshot. Remember, um, this information is also on um, AJC's website. Oh, if you go, just one more slide. Okay, it should say self-response mail-out areas. Great. 
Um, so this is a, a great slide to just reference um, when these mailers are going to people's households. For 95% of the population, uh, people are going to get a invitation to participate in the census, either hand delivered to them or um, they will get it in their mailbox. Um, there are going to be a total of five mailings, um, and the only way you'll get all five is if you don't respond by the fifth mailing. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but it's important to note that um, everyone is going to start to get these on March 12th. Um, there will be a cycle, so uh, so as not to overwhelm the post office, the Census Bureau will be mailing these on March 12th, March 13th, March 19th, and March 20th. So there, it will be rolling um, in each of these mailers. That's why there's a window. Um, but know that people are going to start to have these land very soon uh, and, and start to have questions about this. Um, so the schedule here um, is that folks will receive an invitation letter. Um, the envelope will look like that with that draft that's uh, shared right there on the screen. Um, the second mailer will be a reminder letter. Uh, and then the third mailer um, will be a reminder postcard. Note that the only way you'll get the third mailer is if you did not respond to the census before um, they mail out the third one. So if you respond right away, you won't get any additional mail if you don't want to be spammed. Um, the fourth mailer coming uh, between April 8th and April 16th is a really important one. So folks are concerned about, you know, I only want to respond by paper. Well, they're in luck. They're going to get a paper form in that fourth mailer. Um, every household will get it. You don't have to call the Census Bureau. In fact, you can't to request one. You will get a paper mailer by that, uh, a paper questionnaire by that fourth mailer. Um, and again, you'll only get that mailer if you um, haven't uh, already responded. Um, the fifth mailer, you'll get a it's too late. It's not too late. Postcard, um, April 20th through the 27th, um, and uh, it'll be kind of the last ditch effort from a census counts campaign perspective and um, as a. a stakeholder group and, and partner, and we are really focused on trying to get as many people to self-respond before April 30th. That is not a deadline, but it is the marker of when the Census Bureau will take response rates from the self-response period and then determine where those enumerators, those door knockers, um, those census takers, where they're going to go. Um, so if folks don't want to be, um, don't want to have someone come and knock on their door, the best thing they can do is respond by April 30th. Um, it is important to note that no materials will be mailed to, po to post office boxes. Um, there are other operations, it's called update leave, meaning um, some of these invitations may be hand delivered to households. Um, so that is a, a slight distinction if, if you're engaging with folks with, uh, 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 who may have a, post, uh, a PO box. If you go to the next slide, I just want to show on the screen what the invitation letter is going to look like. Um, so it will be in that envelope that was shown on the screen previous, um, and then it'll have kind of this overall invitation. Some folks will receive a bilingual Spanish and English version of this. Um, some will receive only an English version. Um, this will be accompanied by a language assistance um, elevating the phone response. Uh, the phone questionnaire assistance um, in the and language support there, uh, but it will only be either English or bilingual Spanish and English. Um, note that on this invitation letter, you'll have your um, census ID noted here, and that's going to be by household. So each household will be um, uh, given that uh, that uh, census ID. If you go to the next slide, so. I mentioned that um, you know there's that mailing schedule, fourth mailer, you will receive um, the paper questionnaire guaranteed. Um, there is a slight uh, kind of asterisk to that. Um, for some rural communities uh, or areas that have limited internet accessibility, some of those um, are categorized um, as internet choice, meaning they will get that paper questionnaire in the first mailer. Um, so 20% of those homes um, out, out of that universe of 95% of the country will get a paper mailer in the first questionnaire. Um, and this is um, also just breaking it out, uh, both that internet choice and the folks who will receive that paper questionnaire um, after they've already received three invitations to participate online and by phone first. Um, those are both either English or English and Spanish bilingual. If you go to the next slide, 
So I think the next logical question is how do I know if I'm going to get a paper form in my first mailer or if I'm going to get it in that fourth mailer? Um, I would really recommend checking out the CUNY um, Hard to Count Map. The Census Hard to Count Maps 2020.us. Um, there is a layer where you can really go into your community and see um, what type of initial contact people are going to get. So will we get a uh, that internet first type of outreach? Will we get internet choice? So meaning we'll get that paper questionnaire first. Um, this is a, a really good tool to figure that out and to do that deep analysis in your community. If you go to the next slide, um, this is kind of another plug for the CUNY map, but I also just want to mention that all of you know your communities uh, best. Uh, and the CUNY map is also a great way to identify kind of concentration of hard to count um, communities. Um, and as we continue, I'm going to start talking about some of the outreach tools and, and tactics, uh, notably questionnaire assistance. Um, as you are monitoring that um, and determining where to deploy some of these resources, the CUNY Hard to Count map is a great way um, and a great tool to use to determine um, how to make some of those decisions. Um, relying, of course, on your individual uh, knowledge and understanding of what your community needs. If you go to the next slide, um, briefly, there's a number of ways that you can um, reach out to um, hard to reach communities in your area. Um, pledge cards are a way. This is a copy of ours, which you're, really, you're happy to co-brand. I think AJC also has a co-brandable um, pledge card that's available on their website. Um, there are digital outreach um, using uh, kind of Facebook and Twitter to, to engage folks. Um, there's canvassing, community gatherings, and then also questionnaire assistance. If we go to the next slide, I mentioned to folks that um, there's likely going to be door-to-door -door canvassing happening during the self-response period. Um, we're recommending to folks that if you're planning to do door-to-door -door canvassing, uh, plan to stop that around mid-May because we don't want to confuse community members about uh, stakeholder groups versus uh, Census Bureau enumerators. Um, we're already starting to see kind of confusion about some other Census Bureau surveys that are going around um, versus the 2020 Census. Uh, and so it's really just important that we, we keep the lines of communication um, clear uh, and, and, uh, and allow the Census Bureau to be able to do the important work that they have to do. A few um, guidelines to keep in mind. One, uh, organizations that are doing door-to-door -door canvassing should identify that you are not representing and do not work for the Census Bureau. If there are Census Bureau workers going door-to-door, -door, don't shadow them. Allow them space. Maybe it's skipping that door um, in that pass and then coming back if you have time or just noting it um, as a not home so, it's a, so you're able to come, and come back and catch it. Um, I would recommend also stop canvassing by about May 13th so as not to interfere with on-the-ground efforts, like I mentioned. Uh, and also, important, don't fill out questionnaires for respondents. Uh, but do become familiar with the questions about the 2020 census questionnaire that folks may have. Um, so uh, what we want to do is be answering people's questions, doing education, having conversations about the importance of the census, uh, but we don't want to uh, fill um, out forms for people um, without, uh, you know, uh, and, and inadvertently violate Title 13 protections. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so a couple tools I want to lift up about uh, monitoring the count in real time. There's going to be a lot of data available um, in March, um, at starting March 20th, uh, and going through the self-response period so that you can see uh, how your community is responding to the census in live time. Um, on the right-hand side of this slide, um, you will see two links. Um, the CUNY Hard to Count map will be tracking self-response rates um, daily there, um, and they'll be communicating with the Bureau to make sure that the, that the information is consistent. It'll also be available on the Census Bureau response map, which is also available there. Um, this will be available daily. Um, note that um, we are calling uh, 2020 response rates, their response rates, because it obviously captures uh, phone response, uh, online response, and then the mail back response, uh, it's comparable to the 2010 uh, mail return rates. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is about like kind of the level of um, uh, granularity that you'll be able to get during monitoring the count for your internal planning. If you go to the next slide, 
There's a number of reasons why to use data in real time. Here's a few of them. Um, but I think for me, it's really optimizing, optimizing, optimizing. Um, it's something the Census Bureau is doing for their outreach and something that we should definitely be doing as best practice as well. Um, and so it really allows you to put the resources where maybe self-response rates are lacking um, and where you can really make the most impact. If you go to the next slide, so I'm going to quickly talk through the um, Census Bureau Questionnaire Assistance Program uh, and then how if you want to deploy questionnaire assistance, some guidelines and thoughts and things to think about. Um, so uh, Mobile Questionnaire Assistance, MQA, is the Census Bureau's uh, outreach plan um, to deploy 4,700 census response representatives with mobile tablets to provide questionnaire assistance to communities. They will have Census Bureau employees who are sworn, um, are under Title 13 confidentiality protections, uh, and are able to accept responses to the census and support people. The way that they're going to deploy people um, is based on live response rates. So they'll be looking at the lowest um, percentage of of self-response rates and working with community partners to deploy people to areas where community members already are. Um, the way this will go from a timing perspective is that in late March they'll start initial response um, and we'll be kind of looking at areas where there's predicted low response so they'll really be relying on that 2010 mail, retu mail return rate and other historical data and then starting in April they'll use their live response map and tracking. You go to the next slide. So two, thi or three, two things you can do right now is um, identify kind of any high priority or low responding areas historically that you would want to have an MQA um, and reach out to your Census Bureau Partnership Specialist and ask them if, to partner. You can make that request now. You can request this MQA now. Um, and then make a plan to welcome MQA staff to a local or community event. You also can set up your own questionnaire systems or your own census kiosk. If you go to the next slide, um, a couple of things you can think about is training your staff on the 2020 census so they can answer questions. This is a photo from Georgia where they're providing uh, some, question, some technical assistance and some Wi-Fi to barbershops so that they can do some questionnaire assistance. Um, you can also provide language assistance guides, Wi-Fi, hotspots, phone lines, uh, computers or devices um, so that folks can respond. Please just note, um, like I mentioned with canvassing, we don't want to collect census responses um, in, as a part of these efforts. What we want to do is answer people's questions and motivate them to respond. The next slide. You may also see folks talking about census kiosks. Um, this is a photo of a library in LA County where they're setting up census kiosks where there's uh, terminals that are dedicated to census response. They're locking them to 2020census.gov. Uh, so that'll be the only thing you can access on that terminal. Folks can go in, uh, respond to their census form, uh, and then uh, and use that use that space. So that's something to think of. There's a, there are num a number of resources um, to set these things up. Uh, if, if you're interested. My last slide um, is just another plug for resources. I think Bessie at the top mentioned the amazing um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice hotline that's available in a number of languages. I also just want to flag um, that there is, we're working with um, Community Connect Labs to make available a chat bot um, for uh, folks to be able to, to get their questions answered about the census. That'll be programmed um, for, for people to be able to, uh, to support any of your kind of frontline staff that may be uh, providing questionnaire assistance and have any additional questions. So that is me, and uh, I think I'll turn it back to Bethy. Beth, thank you. That was very informative, and I appreciate you going over the intricacies and details of the census mailing operations. Um, I will turn it over to our next speaker, Sue Hare, who's with Arab American Institute. Great, thank you, Vessi, and thanks, Beth, for giving that overview. Um, so I am Suhair Adi. I work at the Arab American Institute, and I am running the Yellow Count Me In campaign. So you all can go on to the next slide. Next slide. Thanks. <laughs> um, so this is the campaign uh, that we launched back on April 1st of 2019, and it's a national campaign to get out the count of Arab Americans. It's a bilingual Arabic and English campaign. Next slide. 
So there are various options that um, a lot of organizations have stepped up to the plate and the Census Bureau has stepped up somewhat to the plate in terms of providing for different uh, communities to be able to fill out the census form in language. So the first option, and this is the one, as Beth mentioned earlier, that most people will be invited to respond online. Um, the online response option will have a 13 language ability or accessibility. Um, 13 languages is including English, um, and it also includes Arabic, and it also includes a number of Asian languages, though not all. Um, and the online response, what we will say is you can access it without having a unique code, even though that they say that there's an ID that will be sent to you all. Um, I'll get into more detail about what that will look like later. But the second option will be the phone option. Um, that again is in 13 languages. Um, Arabic is included in that and it, 13 languages includes English as well. And the uh, third kind of way of responding, which is probably the one most people are familiar with and has kind of shifted this time around, is the paper response form. Um, that one will be sent to you as Beth elaborated a bit more in the fourth mailing. Um, you cannot ask the Census Bureau, you can't go to a office or something and ask them to send you a form earlier. So that's something to be mindful of. But the paper form is only in English and in Spanish. However, there are uh, language guides, 59 language guides that you can use to fill out your paper form. Next slide. So the hotlines, um, there are as we all have kind of touched upon different hotlines that were launched to be able to protect the census, but also allow you all to ask questions um, in language and get the support that you need, whether it's about how much questions you have to actually fill out on the form or just where to go to fill it out. So we have our Arabic and English Duny hotline. Um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice has their hotline and then the Leo has their own hotline. And I'll also uh, say that the Lawyers Committee has a legal hotline that all of our organizations are also part of. Next slide. So a bit more about the need for language accessibility that I don't think I need to really reemphasize this point, but just quickly, um, for our community, there has been a lot of research done on whether or not Arabic would be provided as a language um, for the paper form or for other types of forms. And because of the increase in Arabic language, 20, from 2010 to 2017, that was 42% of um, Arabic speakers growing in the United States. And it, it's the sixth most spoken language that they allowed it to be at least part of the online form and also a part of the phone option. Um, it's also correlated to the MENA category, so a lot of people had asked us about that. Um, it's not going to be included on the 2020 census, but it's part of the reason why there is an interest in the Bureau internally in ensuring that folks are counted accurately and are given the space on the form. Next slide. So we have a lot of people asking us how to answer race and ethnicity. So we thought we'd give a quick rundown on how we talk about it with our community members, and that might serve as in, uh, informative to you all. So there's two steps. Um, one, you get the Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin question. That's the first question that you answer. And if you're not of any of that, you say no, and you move on to the next part. Or if you are, then you you know check off the appropriate category. Um, for the second portion, we always say to write in your family's ethnic origin. The reason we say that is because the way that the Bureau codes um, different responses so that you're able to get information on Chinese Americans or Arab Americans, specifically like Palestinian Americans, is through that coding process and they don't, they can't code you unless you specify that answer. Um, that's the way that we are able to, as Census Information Center, AI at least, um, pull that information for researchers, journalists, and the like. Next slide. So we have a different scenarios to kind of elaborate a bit more on how this works, but let's say that somebody is of Palestinian and Syrian descent, they are not Hispanic, so they check off no, and they go on to check off other because they don't feel like any of the categories encompass who they are, and they write in Palestinian, comma, Syrian. Um, similarly, if you're of Lebanese descent, but you identify as white racially, then you would check off white and write in Lebanese. Next slide. Then we have a lot of, Part um, our community is very racially diverse, so we talk. Uh, we try to encompass that in terms of the examples that we're giving. Um, so, if you are a Somali American and you decide that you don't, you identify with Black or African American, you check off Black and then you write in Somali. And the last one, because as many people in this globalized world that we're living in, can be uh, multiple different ethnic backgrounds. Um, we have a lot of members of our community who are mixed, so we say that if you're Iraqi and Venezuelan, that you would check off 
yes, another Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, and then write in Venezuelan, and then check off um, some other race, and then write in Iraqi. Next slide. So the way that um, Beth showed the draft of the letter, so I won't spend too much time on that, but um, you will be getting that sent to your address in the coming weeks now. Um, and then when you get that code and you are able to put it in and we'll go through all that in more detail. Um, there, I will say for the online response form, if you do not have any activity for 15 minutes, there will be a notification after 13 minutes of inactivity and then the session will end. You cannot reaccess the portal, you can't save and go back to it, you have to do it all in one sitting. Um, and the portal is available in the 13 languages that we mentioned. Next slide. So when you start off, you'll be prompted to um, www.mycensus.gov or uh, 2020census.gov, um, and you will be able to click which language that you identify with um, that you would like to answer your form in. Then you can select Start Questionnaire. After you click Start Questionnaire, you're directed to a login. That login is going to prompt you to put in that unique code. If you don't have the ID beneath it, you'll see that there is a Do Not Have Code. You can click that, and it's a different process, but we'll walk through that. Next slide. So if, regardless of whether or not you have a code, you have to um, verify your address is the next step. So if you don't have a code, you would actually insert your address manually. Um, if not, the code should auto-generate a address for you that would ideally be the one that you're filling out your form from or that is your household. If you think that it is not correct, you can select no and re-enter it manually. If it's correct, you select yes and you move forward to the next part. Um, they will ask you then to confirm that address, and you, you will have to confirm that it's your address for April 1st of 2020. Again, that's a reference day. It's not like that is the end-all be-all, but that's the day that we try to use to make sure that everyone is counted accurately across the board. Next slide. So we'll then move on to household questions. Those are the people who live with you and make up your household. Um, so you insert different names for all the individuals who live with you, including telephone numbers. You then click add person, you insert more of those um, types of people. You can continue on down for a very long time, so it doesn't matter how many people live with you, that you can ensure you can add, you know, grandparents, children that live with you, and so on and so forth. Um, you then insert the birthdays for all the people who live with you and then their age, so as a way of verification. Next slide. And then you will get prompted to answer people questions about every individual who lives in the household. So they'll ask you, is first person of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? You can click off more than one of the boxes. So if your identity um, necessitates you to check more than one box, you can feel comfortable doing so. Um, if not, you can also check off no and then move on to the next section. For the race questions, you can check off all of the different categories, again, multiple ones. Um, they encourage you to write in your family's ethnic origin, and again, that's the important part for us to make sure that the count is as accurate as possible. Um, so be sure to write it in that box after you check off each category. Next slide. Then you will be asked to review any of the sections below. Um, after you confirm that all the fields are correct, you will then click Submit Questionnaire. You also have the opportunity, if you think that anything is incorrect, to go back and edit the questionnaire. Um, but again, you can you have to do it in that sitting. You cannot edit it after you submit it. Next slide. So that's a little bit more about um, what it looks like in terms of the online portal. Um, for the different resources that exist for people about how to fill out the census questionnaire and, and the form, um, we have a race and ethnicity response sheet to go into detail about what that looks like. Like I went through earlier, it covers all those scenarios as well. A census counts New America and Yellow Count Me and created an ISR, so Internet Self-Response Fact Sheet. Um, you can go on Census Counts website to access that or you'll account me in, and all the partners, I think, have that one also up. Um, Count Us in 2020 has a how do I respond to the 2020 census and what does it ask me question um, fact sheet that you all can use. Um, there's also a webinar on the Hispanic origin and race question in the, census, in the 2020 census that Naleo has on their website. Um, and every group has an iteration of what does the 2020 census ask me. It also goes over what the census does not ask you, which is equally as important to be aware of and to make sure that our community members are aware of. Um, and then you can also be sure to 
ask, uh, call the hotlines that we mentioned before to ask any questions about how to fill out your form or to get any guidance about what is needed on those um, response forms. Next slide. So um, now I'm going to go over more on census data and data confidentiality. So I mentioned a bit earlier that as you are coded, that de decides whether or not you know you are able to be put into that category, and that information is aggregated in a way that your data is kept confidential. So um, we are very invested in making sure that it's an accurate count, but also that the data is as accurate as possible. Um, because census data is used to determine $8 billion in federal funding, decisions that are made by businesses or academics and local governments, and then also in, it impacts our political power for reapportionment, and redistricting, and enforcement into principal rights laws and uh, voting legislation. The online response, um, we like to give the caveat that while that's kind of the new addition to what makes the 2020 census a more um, um, technological census. Um, it also poses a barrier to individuals who lack access to a reliable internet, even though that people can access it on their smartphones and things like that, and that it uh, creates legitimate questions around data security and privacy. Um, those are not things to be minimized, it's just we want to lay that out there as we know those are concerns and we hear those concerns. Um, we're working with the Bureau to try to ensure that that is not um, a barrier for individuals moving forward. And if you are a person that lacks internet access that the Bureau has designated, you'll be getting the paper form the first mailing. Um, there are also more general concerns within community members that they have around data confidentiality, like many Arab Americans, 54% felt that data is being used to profile them as Arab Americans. Um, and they're more likely, though, to fill out their census form, 72% are, it's saying that census protects your data and your identity is anonymous. Next slide. So the way that we talk about those things and try to encourage community members to want to fill out their census form and not be scared of um, giving their information to the Bureau is by explaining what Title 13 of the U.S. Code is. So it's the most protected data provision. There is literally um, no one that does not work within the Census Bureau that doesn't swear an oath to protect all of the data that is given to the Census Bureau. Um, you're subject to five years of prison and $250,000 fine if you are violating the oath, even after you leave the Bureau. So let's say you work in a different capacity now. Um, if you violate this oath, you're still subject to those things. So um, that is to say that we feel that the data is very secured and that we really encourage everyone to still fill it out. Um, and we are also here to soundboard any concerns that people have, just so we're very transparent with you all and to work through any issues that people face. And you can call the hotlines to talk through more of what that means and what these data protections actually look like. Then there's also differential privacy, which was introduced this time around to make sure that the data is not, quote, personally identifiable, meaning that they won't know and I'll give myself as an example, a Palestinian American living in Washington, DC, they will not be able to identify me and come to me and find my apartment or where I live and you know, attack me or do something. The implementation of differential privacy is basically a system where they add numbers to the data, which makes it a trade-off between extreme accuracy and also privacy. So it's the best way to ensure that the data generally represents what, what it should and what the community looks like in the larger scheme of things, but also maintains um, the privacy and is a little less accurate, but gives a general representation. So we know that differential privacy has not been used before and we don't know how it's going to impact smaller populations, but a lot of organizations are working with the Bureau to ensure that we're still getting access to our community's uh, data and that um, the data that the Bureau is looking at and collects is completely confidential, um, and if they violate that, they're violating the law. Next slide. So um, we have a whole kind of setup on disinformation and how that will play into confidentiality. Um, we know that people are fe fearful of, you know, their privacy being um, sought, basically removed from the equation. And so we want people to know that if they see something where they are being told that, you know, 
the bureaus using your information for X nefarious reason, that they can contact us and that we can look into that um, situation um, and can find out whether or not that's true and how do we move forward as a community. So there are mechanisms to do this. There'll be a portal um, that all of the groups will be using soon. Um, but in the meantime, you can feel free to call the hotlines as a way to aggregate that. Um, and it's just better to take a picture and send it to us all so that we know what's going on and you know your various community representatives and the different census counts uh, campaigns that are affiliated with it. Um, and then if you can just pass out different like fact sheets, we have a scams in the census fact sheet. Um, we know that other organizations do as well and pass out information about the census in advance to circumvent wrong information, and especially information about Title 13 and confidentiality. Next slide. So we have different ways of reporting disinformation. Um, this is a fact sheet that we have that I talked about um, on a, the Yellow Count Me In website. It's also on Census Counts. Um, it just walks you through on how to flag disinformation for the platforms as well as reporting it to us. Next slide. That is all that I have. So I will pass it back now to Bessie. Here, thank you for walking through all of the screenshots. That was so informative about what the online portal will actually look like and um, all the different ways to report misinformation and disinformation. Um, we are going to now move into Q&A. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar as well as the presentation will be shared with everyone after the event today. And there are a few different ways to ask questions. You can either use the questions box or chat box and type in your question or you can raise your hand to have your line unmuted, um, and that way you can ask the question yourself. And we already have a few questions that we'll get started with. The first question is from Philip about community canvassing. Beth, could you, um, go over again, any recommended stop dates for community canvassing? Yes, absolutely. Um, and what I'll actually do is start with a plug um, and a, a thank you to Asian American Advancing Justice who worked really closely with um, the Census Count campaign on our Get Out the Count toolkit. Um, I think I should be able to put in the chat box um, a link to our field guidance. Um, it's available at censuscounts.org forward slash GOTC dash toolkit dash field dash guidance. <laughs> so I will put that in the um, uh, in the chat bot, I think, if I'm able to do that. Um, the one thing I would just say um, is uh, is that uh, one of the things we are recommending um, is that folks um, stop going door to door before the non-response follow-up um, period starts. Um, we do recognize that that some groups, um, and particularly um, in California, I know, um, are planning to continue canvassing during the non-response follow-up period. And I think if you already have plans for that, there are a couple of things that you can do um, to mitigate the risk that community members are confused um, or that there are any kind of um, attempts to capitalize or um, have kind of fraud take place uh, during that period. One is just be really clear that you are not a Census Bureau employee when you're going door to door. Um, don't collect information um, door to door. So, you know, the Census Bureau will be doing that. Use it really as a, uh, a motivation, a education opportunity um, with folks. Um, and uh, really um, be clear. Um, it's also a good opportunity if you're going to kind of do door-to-door -door canvas um, drops, uh, kind of literature drops. Um, you can uh, provide, hey, remember, you can still self-respond during the non-response follow-up phase during that period. Um, but what we are we are recommending that if you are able to to stop doing door-to-door -door canvassing before March or before May 13th, when that non-response follow-up phase um, begins. Thank you. And our next question is from Bill for Suhair. Um, I know the RNC has been sending out fake census material that looks like it might be the real census form. Is there anything that can be done to stop this practice? 
Yeah, and I think Beth, you can also jump in on this one because you uh, sent out some sort of guidance on this, but um, we've been monitoring that for a while, actually. It showed up in a variety of different states and different communities. And so the Bureau's rumor page has already been reporting on it and have said, you know, they're trying to debunk it and trying to make sure that people know that they don't have to actually fill that out. Um, I don't know of any other kind of measures being taken by, you know, lo like local governments. I know some people um, in Michigan, for example, are, are talking to local government to see if they can try to do something internally with um, the GOP there and tr trying to ask them, like, if they can denounce it or put out a statement against it. Um, but if, Beth, if you have anything else to add, that's the only thing I really have on that. Yeah, I think that's that's right, um, Sue Hare. I would say that the best thing that people can do, um, particularly since this has gotten uh, a lot of coverage and it's being seen across the country, um, is to inoculate um, communities against these mailers and educate folks, provide photos of the envelope and the invitation letter that's going to go from the Census Bureau so that they don't get confused. Um, also, educating folks about what they are going to be asked by the Census Bureau and what they won't be asked. This GOP mailer is a fundraising mailer, so it asks for money. The Census Bureau will never ask you for money. So. Um, on a number of levels, um, doing that inoculation and that education of communities about, you know, you won't get an invitation from the Census Bureau until after March 12th. So, you know, that March 12th through March 20th, check your mailbox. If anything comes before that, it's probably not um, a 2020 census mailer. Um, and also to just be educating folks, this is what it's going to look like. This is the invitation letter. This is what the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, envelope is going to look like. Um, on, on other efforts, I will say um, Congressman uh, Maloney and Congressman Clay sent a letter to um, the Postmaster General, who actually has jurisdiction on um, what mailing can be sent out, uh, and particularly if it impersonates federal mail or federal agency. Uh, and, and yes, there are some um, kind of state-specific outreaches happening as well. Thank you. And we have a question in regards to questionnaire assistance and language support from Kristen. I think this is for both um, Beth and Sue Hare. Since there are sample forms available, is it okay for people to practice down writing their responses as long as staff don't collect those forms? Um, and then also for organizations working with clients who are not literate in English or their own language, um, where phone language assistance doesn't correspond with their language needs, is it okay for organizations and leaders to accompany clients to MQA events um, or host one to help with translation interpretation? So, Hera, do you want to cover that or do you want to? Yeah, I can do the uh, second half of that for sure. Um, so for the uh, language access, so we have a lot of service organizations that are working with us and they're hosting like sites where people who are in their waiting rooms, for example, can fill out their census form. What we tell them is that you, as long as you're not actually putting in their information for them, but are clarifying if they're like clarifying questions and things like that, providing that support, that I think that's fine. Um, there's also the ability to direct them to call either the hotline or, I mean, you all are trusted messengers in your community, right? So if you're doing this outreach with your own clients, then it makes perfect sense for me that as long as you go through these trainings or are active in these um, conversations and know the information and give accurate information that you can feel free to do so, as long as you're just not being the one who's inserting the information or collecting that information. Because again, you're not bound by Title 13 and we don't really want to encourage anyone to replicate the work that you all are doing and saying that they're a part of your group or organization and then taking the, their data for malicious intent and using it against them. So we're very cautious of that tension. Um, however, if it's clients that you've worked with closely and you're not collecting any personal information but are actually providing just clarification about questions, that that's fine. Thank you. And Beth, do you want to take the first question if it's okay for people to practice writing down their responses on sample forms as long as staff aren't collecting those forms? Yeah, um, so 
Yes. Um, so uh, as Suhair mentioned, there are 12 um, non-English languages available for response support um, via the telephone questionnaire assistance. And then the Census Bureau has 60 language guides, which are essentially like a sample ballot. Um, and so for folks who are using those or want to practice or want to have support, those are available. And there is also a draft form um, available on the, like that's blank, that's available on uh, 2020census.gov as well. Um, we, during our train the trainers, download those and um, pass them out and ask people to, uh, like all the participants that are getting trained to, to take a census live just to kind of, you know, see what that's like. For participants, I would say, you know, certainly that is something that you can do. I would not recommend, and I think it's a uh, kind of a legal consideration. I am uh, not a lawyer, so I'm not giving legal advice, but um, what I would say is um, you don't want to be in a position where there is even the appearance that you as an organization or as an entity are collecting census um, uh, data um, and then therefore, you know, could breach those very strong Title 13 protections that Suhair mentioned. So just be careful um, and uh, and certainly kind of confer with your own counsel about that. But uh, yeah, I think that, you know, there are resources there to, to help folks um, kind of plan and, and provide their, uh, their response. Thank you. And we have one last question from James, and I think this is for you, Beth. Are there any concerns that the U.S. Census Bureau will not have the capacity to do door-to-door -door canvassing to all households that haven't responded by NERFU? Um, and what's the projected need for CBOs to continue contacting residents beyond the soft response period, even if it's not through door-to-door -door canvassing? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to add a, a note to this, which I was kind of excited about, but um, one thing I uh, usually as a part of this question, the thing that comes up is, well, what happens, you know, if the technology doesn't work and folks who wanted to respond online are not able to, um, I will just note that the Census Bureau has a contingency plan and, actually, and has actually printed enough forms to go um, to everyone and, and uh, kind of go out to everyone if that's needed. Um, so there are, there are contingencies. Um, for the non-response follow-up phase, uh, people may get up to six door knocks. Um, most folks um, will at least get one. Um, and the way uh, that kind of subsequent visits uh, take place um, kind of really revolve around whether or not it's an occupied um, housing unit, um, the uh, kind of uh, kind of ability of, of them to, to kind of access that information in later visits, they may go and get a proxy response, meaning they may go to a next or another neighbor and ask um, for as much information um, as possible about um, that household. So, you know, how many people live in the house? Uh, do you know their race and ethnicity? This is all the reasons why having um, people self-respond makes the most sense because you really get to determine, you know, your participation in the census, right? Um, so it may it may look that way. Um, there is some conversation, and we're monitoring this, is that um, due to kind of budget uh, projections that the Bureau had rolled out, that they would kind of cut back on kind of not do all six of those visits and have contingencies in place. The Bureau does have full funding to do the, and, and uh, they actually, as a part of um, a lot of stakeholder work, including a lot of work with Asian Americans Advancing Justice, um, lobbying the Hill, um, the Bureau uh, has uh, over a, a billion dollars over their original request. So they have the funding to be able to do kind of full set outreach during non-response follow-up, uh, and we'll obviously be monitoring that um, in live time. Thank you, Beth. It looks like we have no further questions at this time, so we will end the webinar. But again, a recording of the webinar and a copy of the presentation will be circulated to everyone. Um, thank you, Beth and Sue Hare, for being on the webinar today and sharing your knowledge. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, we do have a few more webinars planned in April. We'll be call covering the non-response follow-up. Um, we'll also have a second webinar covering um, additional information about non-response follow-up. And we also have a webinar planned in June talking about census next steps this enumeration. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in today and we look forward to being in touch. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out.